Hi, and welcome to Chapter 3, Financial Statements and Ratio Analysis. So in this chapter, our learning goals is basically to understand the stockholders' report and understand the financial statements, income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows that companies prepare and shareholders use to review the performance of a company. We also want to understand how financial analysts use financial ratios and specifically to analyze a company's liquidity and activity. When we talked about activity, we're talking about the uh, activity of the assets and the profit activity of a company. Now we want to discuss the relationship between debt and financial leverage and use the ratios to analyze the firm's debt, specifically debt to assets, debt to equity. And we want to use ratios to analyze um, the firm's profitability and its market value. Market value rates relates to how valuable the company is within its stock market. And we can use a summary of financial ratios to, to get an idea of how a company is doing within uh, year over year and within their industry. Now, we have to start out, at the beginning of the story, we start out at GAAP, which is the generally accepted accounting principles, which are set up and authorized by FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. Now, these, these, this body who creates the GAAP, they're looking to create a unified and consistent accounting uh, guidelines for companies to put together their financial reports. So all financial reports have a similarity in how they're developed, how they're calculated, and the record keeping to put the numbers together, which is very handy because it makes it comparable between companies and also comparable between quarters and years within the same company. In the early 2000s, we had a lot of conflicts between uh, auditing companies and companies as far as preparing reports and analyzing and recommending stocks. There was conflicts of interest between corporations uh, and their auditing bodies. And sometimes corporations were, were also doing joint ventures with the same companies that were auditing them, hence the conflict of uh, uh, conflicts. Also, um, a lot of public companies may be doing business with uh, companies that are actually recommending consumers to buy or sell their stock. So you can see the pressure if I'm doing business with a company and I'm also analyzing and putting recommendations on their stock, there's going to be a pressure for me to uh, recommend their stock or, or put a valuation on a stock that would norm higher than it's normally worth. And a lot of that happened in two, you know, up to 2002 and then the sorbanes actually was passed to put a better control on, on this type of activity. And they want to protect the interests of investors and the public as far as information becoming fair and independent and the aud auditing reports being accurate. Now, the public corporations with more than 5 million assets and more than 500 st um, stockholders are required to the file, required by the SEC, Security and Exchange Commission, to file their annual reports, to provide stockholders with annual stockholder reports to summarize how the firm's financial activity occurred during the year. Now, in a global focus, there are international financial reporting standards and International Accounting Standards Board, which help to set a guideline and a uh, regularity on uh, financials for companies who are more international. So it's not uncommon that a company may put their books to um, according to GAAP, but they're also going to look maybe uh, if they have a significant amount of shareholders outside of the country that their uh, their main record keeping is produced. They may want to also have you know, international financial uh, reporting stand, meet the international financial reporting standards as well. So in the United States, public companies are required to report financial statements using GAAP, which requires more detail than the um, international financial reporting standards. So GAAP is actually the gold standard, so it's easier for them to backtrack and meet the international standards if they're meeting GAAP. In fact, a lot of foreign companies will just go ahead and meet the GAAP standards so their stocks can more easily trade on American exchanges. So we focus on ethics. Ethics plays a big part in accounting and finance. So when we, when we talk about earnings reports, do we take them at face value? So near the end of each quarter, companies have to unveil their quarterly performance. And firms want to beat their estimates and they want to see their share price jump. So they manage their profits in a way that helps to minimize missing their estimates and maximize making or exceeding their estimates. So if you miss your estimates and profits um, in profits or sales, your stock tends to suffer big declines. And the practice of manipulating earnings to make sure you don't, don't miss 
um, your earnings targets is what got a lot of companies into trouble as they were too aggressively managed earnings leading them to fraudulent behavior. Um, so if you do it in a way that's legal and, and is appropriate according to GAAP, then we'd say that you're just, you're just managing your earnings, not manipulating them uh, illegally or fraudulently. So financial managers are tempted to manage earnings to make sure that they meet their, their estimates and their goals of profits and revenues for each quarter. So is it unethical for managers, manage, managers to manage their earnings? That, um, if they, I believe that if they're going to manage their earnings in a way that's fraudulent or misleading, that is unethical. But if they're managing their earnings as far as the timing of their sales and what would be legal under GAAP, I think it's okay for them to manage their earnings and, and to have sort of reserves to um, better meet uh, ex investors' expectations as long as they don't mislead them. So there are four key elements or four key financial statements and the first one that's very important especially to finance is the income statement. So the income statement is sort of like your personal paycheck. So if you ever had a, a uh, paycheck and you look at your paycheck and you have your gross pay and then taxes are taken out and maybe 401k is taken out and health insurance is taken out and FICA is taken out then at the end of that you have your net pay and it's very similar for an income statement for a company so it provides a summary of the operating results for a specific period it could be a quarter or a year uh, they are prepared quarterly for reporting purposes but they're also prepared annually they can be computed daily or monthly depending on how the management wants to view them here is a basic income statement and what we look at here if you look at this income statement we like to see year over year much like your report card you want to see yourself improving in your grade point average maybe going from a B average to a B plus then to an A minus we want to see companies do the same thing so we want to see growth in sales which we have here we want to see growth in gross profits which we have here we want to see growth in operating profits which we have here and we want to see a reduction in operating expenses which we don't have here but that's to be expected if the revenues are growing operational expenses are expected to grow as well we just don't want them to grow as fast and we want to have higher operating profits if we manage our interest expenses and taxes properly we want to see an increase in net uh, net profits and you have our net profits before tax and our net profits after tax and then we can use our net profits to calculate our earnings per share um, so basically we start out at revenues and we pick away at that number till we get the bottom uh, net income number and this is very important and we want to see an improvement in our revenues and our profits in our income statement year over year just the same thing in a zoom simulation every year which is around you want to increase your profit margin percentages you want to increase your total profits gross operational net and you want to increase your revenues if you want investors to like you and if you want analysts to score your financial ratios higher and if you want um, people to buy your stock Now, if you had a personal financial example, you would look at your salary, less any uh, interest received on the say savings accounts or dividends received on investments, and you'd have your total income. And then you would just subtract away your expenses, mortgage, auto loan, utilities, home repairs, food, car expense, car insurance, health care, clothes, insurance, taxes, um, entertainment, tuition, personal items to get to your total expenses. And what's left over is your cash surplus or deficit. And you'll notice that in Zoom simulation, at the bottom of your pro forma financial statement, you'll see cash surplus or deficit. So we're really looking at the revenue, the money you bring in from your sales, less all your expenses for the year. And you could do this is more of a personal example that hopefully you can relate to. And before was more the previous slide, this slide was more of a corporate example. Now, what you should do is after you run a few practice rounds, you run a round in the team competition, analyze your financial statement see how you've improved year over year the certain areas where you haven't improved year over year you need to investigate that and figure out how to improve it okay let's move on to the balance sheet now the balance sheet is a summary of the firm's financial position at any given time it's sort of like you going to the you taking a piece of paper down and writing down on to, today writing down all the assets you have and then writing down all your liabilities um, to figure out uh, where you stand. 
So it's only good for one point in time. Uh, and it, it's, so you're looking at what you own and how much of it's financed and how much of it's owned by your own money. So you're looking at your ownership versus your, your liabilities, your equity versus your liabilities. Uh, and again, what we want to look at here is assets. So we'll look at assets first. This is the first part of the balance sheet is assets. And we go from the most liquid to the least liquid generally, or the most current to the longer term assets. So the first section is current assets. We have cash, marketable securities, and accounts receivable and inventories. Cash is cash. We know what that is. Marketable securities are short term investments. Accounts receivable is money that we lent out to people that we uh, that they owe us so it is a asset but we haven't we haven't typically been paid for that yet but we're looking to receive that at some point uh, and an inventory is the money we have in uh, materials that we purchased and what we're looking for here is that you know current assets we'd like current assets to grow uh, along with the company but not too fast you know it has to be proportional to the sales growth Okay, so, when we, so that would be our total current assets. Then we look at long-term assets, building and equipment, machinery, furniture and fixtures, vehicles, other. And then we get our total fixed assets, less depreciation. So fixed assets can depreciate. Buildings and autos and computers depreciate, and we're allowed to, uh, to effectively express how much our assets are truly worth. We're allowed to depreciate them so they show the correct value. So if we own the fleet of 100 cars, and they're five years old, we wouldn't want to show them the value of the original purchase. We want to show them at what their resale value would be today. And that's what depreciation helps us to um, keep in line. So our net fixed assets add uh, our assets together, net, net fixed. Um, and current assets, we add them together and we get our total assets. Now we move on to liabilities. So we look at accounts payable, money we owe other people. Notes payable, which is sort of like bank loans or, or short-term debt we owe other people. Accruals, which is money that we've accrued, means we've accumulated, but we haven't paid yet. That could be something like payrolls. So we have a bunch of payrolls we owe, we haven't paid it yet, but we have the money in the, in the, in the account. So it's a liability. Um, well, let me state that again. This We owe this much in salaries, but we haven't paid it yet, so it's a liability. Once we pay our salaries, and if it was a salary accru uh, accrual, then it would be zero. So this is basically money we owe. Um, so total liabilities would be 620 this is in the millions. This is uh, 620,000 in the thousands. And uh, so we look at a long-term debt, including financial leases, and then we get our total liabilities. Then we look at preferred and common stock, and together those become our paid in excess of par capital stock. So par is sort of our starting position, and you know, money we raise to issuing preferred or common stock gets into our equity pool. And then we have retained earnings, money that the company has made that we've kept, and together they become our shareholders' equity. So our shareholders' equity and a liability together becomes our total liability and shareholders' equity. So you see this 3597? That's the same as assets. So assets have to meet, match our total liability and shareholders' equities. And the reason they match is because anytime we um, accumulate assets we use a form we use generally use equity and liabilities to pay for them so that's how the balance sheet stays in balance now a balance sheet a personal balance sheet and this is this is more what a balance sheet usually looks like assets on the left liabilities and equity sometimes called net worth on the right so we look at this together and we see so this was typical person or this is Jan and John Smith they have you know cash checking accounts savings accounts money markets so total liquid assets Stocks and bonds, mutual funds, retirement funds, total investments, real estate, cars, household furniture, jewelry. So this is their total personal property, and this is our total assets if you take their personal property and you add it to their investments and, and liquid assets. They have 147000 in assets. Now, in liability, they have credit cards, utility bills, medical bills, other liabilities, real estate mortgage, auto loans, educational loans, personal loans, furniture loans. So the total liability is 105000 The net worth is 41000 means that's that's their the money they have in equity. Or for the total value of their assets, they have 41000 that they paid into it or paid off and 105000 in debt. So together that becomes our total liabilities and net worth. And you see how they have to balance? Very important. If the balance sheet doesn't balance, it's not being prepared accurately.
Now a statement of retained earnings, this is what reconciles the net income earned during the year and any cash dividends paid or changes in return earnings from the start of the period to the end of that year. So basically it works like this. A company makes money and it wants to retain that money. So if it has net profits, they can either pay it out as dividends or retain it as earnings or both. So together, retained earnings and paid out dividends are going to be your net profit. And we add that, it accumulates. So we keep adding that to last year's retained earnings. So if our retained earnings started at 1,012 and our, not, our net profits were 231, we paid out 10 in preferred stock and 98 in common stock. It means our total dividends paid are 108,000. So we take our uh, 231 and we want to add that to our retained earnings. So that gives us 1,243. Subtract 108 and we get 135. And that would be our retained earnings. So we're adding the excess, the money above we take basically we take our net profits subtract out our dividends and we add that to our retained earnings to get our new retained earnings so it's sort of like think of it like a bank account whatever money you earn that you put in your savings account when we get to the next year the savings account doesn't go back to zero and then the new money you earn in the next year you add to the savings account so retained earnings is like sort of the money the company has earned that they haven't um, paid out to dividends to investors now the statement of cash flow is a, another financial statement when we look at the movement of cash in the company and it provides a summary of operating investment and financial cash flows that we use to reconcile um, the cash activity for the, for the quarter or the year. So it provides an insight into the company's investments, the money they raise in the financing and the operational activities of profits or losses the company makes. So together with the income statement and uh, balance sheet they give a more complete picture of the company's financial performance and the, and the in the cash flow statement ties to the income and balance sheet it takes elements of both now here's a cash flow statement for a company and we look at you know net profit after taxes so this is the net profit of a company we have our depreciation so the de depreciation is a non-cash charge so if we have depreciation on the income statement we add it back to the cash flow statement so these are going to be so uh, income, net profits, increases cash flow. Depreciation, when we add it back, increases cash flow. Uh, increase in accounts receivable. So if, it, if accounts receivable has increased, that, that decreases cash flow. A decrease in inventory will increase cash flow. An increase in accounts payable will increase cash flow. An increase in accruals will increase cash flow. So cash flow provided by operating activities is 500000 so for any of these receivables, inventories, payables, accruals, you have to understand that if you're borrowing money, to, if you're lending money to people, that's decreasing your cash. If you're buying more inventory, it's decreasing your cash. If you're decreasing your inventory, it's increasing your cash. So you have to look, you have to understand how the money, how cash flows into or out of inventories, payables, receivables, and accruals to understand how it affects cash flow. So when money is being loaned or spent cash flow decreases when money is being borrowed or saved cash flow increases so that would be from your operations this is the most important category because we want we want to have a positive cash flow from operations means the business is healthy now investment activities means that we could buy some more fixed assets so if we buy fixed assets it's going to reduce our cash flow if we sell fixed assets it's going to increase our cash flow okay now Cash flow from finance activity is borrowing money. So if we decrease, if we pay back our loans, this cash flow decreases as we pay back loans. But if we increase our loans, like here we're increasing long-term debt, that's going to increase our cash flow. Just like when you borrow against your credit card, take a cash advance, cash advance against your credit card, you're going to increase your cash position because you're increasing your debt position. Okay. So if you pay any dividends, that's going to decrease your cash because you're paying dividends. Any cash provided by financing activities, um, we add these together to calculate the cash provided by financing activities. Just like we would add these accounts here through cash provided by investment activities and here cash provided by operational activities. So we add up operational, investment, and financing activities to give us our net increase or decrease in cash. And, and cash flow here is increasing 
and the majority of this this in total increase in cash flow is coming from operations this, which means this is a very good cash flow statement to see because we're, we're we're investing in the company and we're paying down debt and paying dividends but we still have positive cash flow because our operations are so strong okay so in, in consolidated international financial statements we have this FASB 52 which mandates that US companies um, translate their foreign currency denominated assets and liabilities into dollars for consolidation to the parent company's financial statements. So if a company has assets overseas in foreign currencies, they have to use the exchange rates to bring them into, the, into line with US dollars, basically translate the value into US dollars and create a, a consolidated set of financial statements. Uh, and you can use the currency rate translation method is a technique used by US based companies to translate foreign currency denominated assets and liabilities into dollars for the consolidated financial statements uh, using a year end cur uh, currency rate rather than a daily currency rate. And you know this way revenues and expenses are treated in a similar, a similar fashion and a similar uh, currency rate. Now, on the other hand, equity accounts are translated into dollars using exchange rates that prevail when the parent company's equity investments were made. So those equity accounts will use the exchange rates on the day of the transactions, and retained earnings are adjusted to reflect uh, the year's operating profits or losses. Okay, so let's move into the next big section of this chapter, which is using financial ratios. Uh, so who is interested in financial ratios? Well. Um, first, let's define what a financial ratio is. It's a method of calculating and interpreting. Um, well, financial ratio is anything using the financial statements to, to put together uh, a measure of performance. Finan a ratio analysis is what I was starting to explain before. Is that it involves the method of calculating these financial ratios to analyze and monitor a firm's performance. So. Um, potential uh, uh, shareholders and stakeholders would be interested in a firm's financial ratios. Creditors who may want to leave, lend the company money will be interested in the financial ratios. And management would be also interested in financial ratios as well as owners. So a lot of people are interested in financial ratios. And so I guess it's one of the reasons in the Zoom simulation, the financial ratios are so um, closely um, reviewed for the overview points. So your year-over-year -year performance and the major, and, uh, I think at least 10 or more financial ratios are considered when you're looking at your evaluation of your company's performance. And that's how it's done in the real world. In the real world, you look at a company's performance and their competitors will make it harder for a company to do well because the competition is fierce and very uh, tough. It makes it harder for a company to earn profits and increase revenues, but companies are always measured by their performance of their financial ratios year-over-year. Year. You could look at industry averages as a financial ratio to compare how a company is doing compared to the competitors, but generally you want to see how the company is performing year over year. Now, you could do a cross-sectional analysis, and this is where you're comparing your company to other companies. So the financial ratios, at the same point in time, how is your company's profit margins compared to similar competitors in your industry? And those industry averages is what you could use to see if you're doing better or worse than your competitors. And you can use benchmarking, which is um, a cross-sectional analysis where um, you look at the financial values of your company compared to competitors in a similar group, and you want to do better than them. So an industry averages are very, com very common for using this cross-sectional analysis benchmarking. So let's look at this company, this manufacturing company. So the, we calculated the inventory turn turnover for 2015, and the average inventory turnovers were as follows. So the turnover for um, 2015 for the, the company was 14.8 and the industry was 9.7. So what does that mean? It means that this manufacturing company turns their inventory more aggressively than the industry. And that's good because higher inventory turns are better. It means you're more efficient with your inventory. Here is an example of a financial ratios and select items for an industry and their median value. So let's look at, here's the industry. So we have computers, Dell and Hewitt Packer. We have building materials, Lowe's and Home Depot, grocery stores, Whole Foods and Kroger, and merchandising stores, Sears and Walmart. So here are the current ratios for everybody, the quick ratios, inventory turnover, average collection period, total asset turnover, debt ratios, profit margins, return on assets, return on common equity. 
So this would this would basically lay out um, at the bottom. Here is the industry average. So we want to see uh, is Dell doing better than the industry average? And if they're not doing better, then you know there's a problem. Okay. We'll talk more about this later, but I think it's important first to go over all of these financial ratios to explain what they mean and the significance of them. Okay, so before we go over the actual financial ratios, let's talk about a time series analysis. So this is an evaluation of the firm's financial performance over time, generally a year over year or quarter over quarter view. And again, this is like your um, academic record. You, when If you're analyzing your academic record, you want to see that semester over semester your grade point average is increasing every semester so you want to compare your current performance to your past performance and you want to see that you're improving and making progress um, so you can see these trends in a multi-year comparison and plot them on charts because companies you always want companies to move forward and improve you know just like in a zoom simulation if you look at the industry charts you'll see charts listing uh, sales revenues profits earnings per share uh, and you want to see that your company is improving every year, the trajectory is moving higher on the line chart, especially compared to your peers. So cross-sectional time analysis or time series analysis will help you see how your company is improving through time. And hopefully it's improving at a steeper rate than, than your competitors. But time series analysis is really just looking at yourself, um, your company, through a period of time, either measuring quarters or years. So here's an example of this one company, and um, we're looking at average collection period in days. And, and so the average collection period in days, the, sh the smaller amount, the less, the quicker you collect, the better. So in this particular case, they, they went from collecting in 40 days to collecting in 60 days, which is bad, where the industry has decreased or maintained. They both, it did increase at the end, but the industry is far below the um, company here. So their collection period is getting worse and it's outstripping the industry. So that would be a time series analysis, usually expressed by charts. And you could see this in the Zoom simulation if you look at the individual or industry charts. We'll, we'll plot your time series of um, evaluation. Let me just pause here for a second. Okay, so using financial ratios <clears throat> and caution about using financial ratio. Well, Financial ratios are a very useful tool and give you a lot of insights into the company. However, um, if a financial ratio reveals a very large uh, deviation from what you normally see, that could, in that could indicate a big problem. Um, a single ratio doesn't necessarily provide enough information to judge the overall performance of a company. You have to look at them together. So you have to look at a set of financial ratios together in unison to get an idea if these companies sick or not are performing well. Um, now the ratios being compared need to be calculated using financial statements dated at the same point in time during during the same year. So you can't you have to get all the information from a set of financial statements that are of the same time period. So you can't use last quarter's financial statements with information from this quarter's financial statements. You have to use they have to all be of the same time. And the financial statement should be audited, uh, officially audited and, the, uh, and signed off by the chief financial officer. And the financial data being uh, compared should have been developed in the same way. And results can be distorted by inflation. So if a company has increased revenues, it, uh, it may be, say the company increased their revenues by 2%. It may just be the fact that they raised prices by 2% to compensate for inflation. So in inflation, when you're looking at a company through, say, a 10-year period, you have to really uh, account for inflation to make the numbers comparable, especially when we're talking, you know, profits and revenues. Okay, so let's illustrate an example of using financial ratios, and we're going to look at uh, Bartlett Company's income statement and balance sheet. Uh, so this is table 3.1 and 3.2. So uh, the current ratio, so let's talk about the current ratio. It measures the ability of a firm to meet its short-term Obligations. So we look at our current assets divided by current liabilities. The higher this number, the better. That means you have more. You want to have more current assets than current liabilities because that gives you ability to pay for your current liabilities with your current assets. So again, you want to you want to see a company having a higher current ratio and having more current assets and current liabilities. Okay. 
Now, when we look at liquidity needs, this is how much cash a company would need and how liquid they are. Um, so large companies have a nice uh, line of credit that they can draw additional funds from. So their liquidity is, um, they're a little bit flexible in their liquidity because they have the ability for them to raise short-term funds pretty easily. Where smaller companies may not have the same access to credit or the same amount of credit, so they tend to be a little bit, um, need to be a little bit more liquid uh, to compensate for the fact that they can't easily raise money quickly, small companies. Now in your personal finance, uh, you would want to look at, you know, your total liquid assets by your total current debt. And again, that would be, you know, just think of this, how much cash do you have in the bank versus how much do you owe on your credit cards? And that would be sort of a, a, a liquidity ratio that you could put together as a personal um, ratio. And you want to make sure that you have more current uh, assets than current liabilities. So let's talk about the sometimes it's called the quick ratio or the acid test ratio and this is this is the current ratio except we should track out inventory and the reason we should track out inventory is because it's not a very liquid it's a least liquid of the current assets so it's a lot of inventory is difficult to sell quickly so we want to um, take take the inventory out of the current assets and then look at this quick ratio again to see how things measure when we're talking about the you know cash mostly cash versus your current liabilities to see uh, how this number looks without inventory and again the higher this number the better and you can see that at 1.51 that's going to be lower than their 1.97 of the current ratio so if a company has inventory their quick ratio will always be lower than their current ratio and you measure by you know how much lower is how you kind of measure how beneficial it is Okay, so, so importance of inventories, if we look at this table, we have Dell, Home Depot, and Lowe's. And we look at their quick ratio and their current ratio. And we see here that Dell has the least amount of inventory because they have the least amount of change between their current and quick. Uh, where Lowe's has the biggest change means that Lowe's has the most inventory. So Dell it's the most efficient in managing their inventory and that's why they have the least amount of loss going from quick going from current to quick ratio where Home Depot and Lowe's are holding a lot of inventory which makes sense because Dell employs a just-in-time inventory so they don't keep a lot of inventory on hand and Home Depot and Lowe's have to stock a lot of inventory on the shelves and that's why um, it's important to see what their quick ratio looks like after you take away from their inventories Now, inventory turnover measures the activity of a firm's inventory. So we look at the cost of goods sold divided by inventory to get the current inventory turnover. So the cost of goods sold is really showing me how much, you know, in, how much... The cost of goods sold is sales um, minus the gross profit margin will give you the cost of goods sold. So it... You look at what was the you look at the revenues and you look at the cost for those revenues and you divide by inventory. And again, the higher this number, the better. So so we're doing a relationship between the the goods sold, the cost of the goods sold, divided by the current inventory you're holding, and it shows that we are inventory turns are seven. So we have seven times the amount of cost of goods sold that we do have inventory. Uh, and and think you know think of it this way: if uh, the more inventory, think of an example of cereal. So if you have, if, if you eat, say, 52 boxes of cereal a year, and you only have one box in inventory in, in your house, then you have a inventory turn of 52, which is very high, but it's very efficient. If you had an inventory turn of one, that would mean that you eat 52 boxes of cereal a year, and you have 52 boxes of cereal currently in your kitchen. So you see how a low inventory turn of one would be inefficient for a company to have all that money. Can you imagine if you went to the supermarket and bought 52 boxes of cereal, how much that would cost? And then you had to stock that in your kitchen. So that would be a lot of cereal to have around. You might have to buy extra storage. You could have spoilage. You could have theft. So that's why it's good that companies keep a smaller, more efficient inventory because they don't tie up as much cash in inventory and they don't have as much risk as inventory being on hand. So one thing that could happen, if you have a year's worth of cereal, maybe some of that cereal expires. So 
that's why companies want to be more efficient with inventory and that's why we look at inventory turnover as a measure. Now we have the average age of inventory which is particularly important for manufacturers who have expiration dates on their inventories. Now the average age of inventory would be 365 days divided by the inventory turnover. So if we take our 365 days, we divide by the inventory turnover of a number that we just calculated, we get our average days of inventory on hand. So here we have 50 days of inventory. So we want to keep this number as low as possible. So this is one of the ratios where we like this number to be lower because these were more efficient with our inventories. So it's sort of like the cereal boxes. Do you want to, if you, do you want to have how many, how many, um, days of cereal boxes do you want to have on hand? Okay. Now the average collection period, uh, this is another very useful ratio. And what we look at here is the period, um, it, you know, the average amount of time needed to collect your accounts receivable. So the, so we take accounts receivable divided by average daily sales per day. Now to calculate the average daily sales per day, we have to take the annual sales and divide by 365. So we take our accounts receivable. We take our sales divided by 365, and that gives us $8,422 of sales per day. So if we take our accounts receivable divided by our sales per day, we get the amount of days that it takes us to collect our money. So uh, the lower this number, the better, because you'd like to collect your money in 10 days rather than 60 days, right? Makes sense. So if you lend money to somebody, the sooner, the shorter period of time it takes for you to collect it, the better. And it's the same thing. It's one of the very rare ratios where we like a lower number here because it means we're collecting our money faster. Now if you're a company, a lot of businesses who do business with other businesses may have to lend uh, credit. So if you're trying to build a materials um, and merchandise, you may have to um, get store credit to, you know, and we want to know some industries, um, you know, it depends on the industry you are. In some industries, if you're if you're buying a lot of materials, uh, generally you're going to buy them on credit. So if you're you're in the industry that are selling things that other companies are going to want credit for, you may have to extend a lot of credit, which means it's important for you to collect that money back at a certain period of time. So average collection, we can also look at average payment period. So this is taking accounts payable now and dividing it by the average purchases per day. So we take um, accounts payable divided by annual purchases divided by 365. So uh, if we assume that Bartlett Company's purchases are valued at 70% of its cost of goods sold, and that, that basically means that the cost of goods sold makes up 70% purchases, 30% labor. So a cost of goods sold, the two ingredients in cost of goods sold is materials and labor. So here we get, we assume that 70% of the cost of goods sold is material. So that's why we take 70% of the annual purchases divided by 365. And then we can take the accounts payable divided by 4,000 and we get our average payment period. So this, you know, this number it takes us 100 days to pay our accounts payable. And the longer we delay payment, the more money, the more cash we have. So, so we like this number to be bigger, but we definitely don't like it to be above 90 days because we could have a bad reputation for not paying on a timely basis. Okay, so let's look at total asset turnover. And this is something from the Zoom simulation. A lot of these, not all of these ratios, but all of these ratios are in the Zoom simulation. This looks like it's sales in relationship to total assets. So if we have sales of 3 million and assets of 3.5 million, we have, to we have a total turnover, asset turnover of less than one which is not ideal. So what we want is our assets to generate more sales. So think of yourself, if you were an ice cream company and you had, say you were uh, like a red mango and you had all these big expensive soft serve machines, you may have a situation like this where your sales are 3 million and your assets are 3.5 million and you have a total asset turnover of less than one. Now let's say you're just a, um, like a uh, Haagen-Dazs that just uses tubs of ice cream and, and doesn't have soft serve machines. Now, you may have a situation where your sales are 3 million, but your assets are only 1 million, giving you a total asset turnover of 3, which is much better. So in the, just like in a Zoom simulation, you don't want to buy uh, excessive factories if you don't need them. You don't want to have 
leftover inventory of cars you didn't sell. These are all things that are going to inflate your assets and reduce your total asset turnover. That's why you want your forecasting to be accurate so you don't have a lot of leftover inventory because that's going to increase your total assets because inventory is an asset and reduce your total asset turnover. And you also don't want to buy factories that you don't need or buy a factory that you're only going to use the factory as a capacity to make a thousand vehicles in the, in the simulation. And if you buy a factory just to make 50 vehicles, your capacity utilization is very low. So you have this big expensive $10 million asset really not producing a lot of sales. And this is another reason your total asset turnover could go lower. Okay. So you want to sell it fast. So if you make something, you want to sell it fast because you want to get them, you want to uh, turn your product into cash as fast as possible and you want to minimize your inventories and you want to sell so ideally for a grocery store the best thing you could hope for is in the morning stock the grocery store with every everything it's going to sell for that day so if they knew exactly what they were going to sell for that day then they stocked the exact amount of what they'd sell that day so they open up with an inventory and they close with everything being sold that's probably the best possible the best of all worlds you could do and the next day a shipment comes to replace everything that's been sold so you do it again. So you'd have a, an inventory turnover of 365. Now this is very difficult for any store to do, and that's why most stores have a bigger stock than you know they they want to keep enough in stock to meet all the demand and not lose out because if a customer comes and there's no milk or eggs, they may not come back again, or they may have to go and buy those from a competitor. So thus you're losing sales. So sometimes it's advantageous to keep a bigger inventory in certain businesses to make sure that you have enough product to sell for to meet your customers demands so in this example patty she's incorporated a new business she she needs an initial investment of fifty thousand and she's considering a no debt plan under which she would invest the full amount without borrowing the second option is a debt plan which involves investing twenty five thousand and balancing the remainder uh, at twelve percent so if she expects 30,000 in sales and 18,000 operating expenses and has a tax rate of 40%, this is sort of what her plans would look like. So in the no debt plan, she would have her current assets, fixed assets, and total assets, the same in both plans. But here, we, she'd have an interest charge. So interests and equity, so um, actually her, not it does interest charge but the total debt is she's borrowing twenty five thousand and putting twenty five thousand dollars of her money in so together her liability and equity is fifty thousand here she's borrowing nothing and putting the full fifty thousand dollars of her money into the business and her her liabilities and equity are the same fifty thousand let's look how that works out in the income statement if you both have the same sales and the same operating expenses and the same operating profits except when you get to the interest expense there's no interest expense here but there's an interest expense for the debt plan. So that reduces the net profit. So you have 12,000 net profits here, 9,000 here. So take your taxes are higher here because you can't deduct, um, you're not deducting your interest from your income, but your overall net profits are 7,200. For here, you're gonna pay less in taxes because your income's lower because your interest is deductible, So your net, but your net profits are also totally lower at 5.4. But if we look at our return on equity, here are you know our equity our return is our profits are 7200 and our equity is 50,000 because we put $50,000 into the business so our return on equity is only 14%. But here our equity is only 25,000 because we only took $25,000 to put into this investment. Our our return is higher even though our our, our return on equity is higher even though our total return is lower since only $25,000 of our own money is in this investment our return on that money is higher. So think about it, say these were um, subway locations. So in this plan, you only have $50,000. In this plan, you can only get one subway location and you're investing $50,000 to buy that one subway location. Maybe in this plan, you have enough money to invest in this could be one subway location, but you can make a second subway location with the other 25,000. So you're borrowing a total of 50,000, investing a total of 50,000. And that way you would still have the same return on equity, but you're going to be doubling this. If you have two locations, this would just be one location. You make 5,400, but two locations, you make uh, 10,800. You'd be making more because the return on equity is higher. Okay, let's look at the debt ratios. So total liabilities divided by total assets uh, gives you tells you how much your assets are financed by debt. So here, the total liabilities are 1.6 million 
total assets are 3.5 million or practically 3.6. So that gives you a debt to asset ratio of 45%, which means that 45% of your assets are financed by debt. So the lower this number, generally the better. It means you're using less debt to finance your assets. Now, if we look at debt to equity, we want to see the relationship to how much um, liability, how much liabilities in your company are financed by um, equity. So we're comparing uh, debt to equity. So here we have a debt of 1.6 million, equity of 1.7. So 97% of um, your equity is comparable to debt. So it's sort of a one for one almost. So this company's um, you know, I think 50% debt, 50% equity, and it's a one to one, close to one to one percent ratio. And this is important to understand how much how much equity do you have compared to how much debt you have. Uh, and you you definitely generally do want to have something close to um, parity on this. Okay, times interest to earn ratio. Here we're looking at how much. Um, we want to look at the ability to pay your interest. How much times your earnings compared to the interest you owe? So in this particular company, they have they owe um, their earnings before interest and tax of four hundred eighteen thousand, and their um, if we divide that by their taxes, we get a times interest to earn ratio of four point four nine. So it measures the ability to pay your interest payments. So remember EBIT is the same as operating profits in the income statement. So if we imply, you know, a lot of times when I look at times interest earn ratio, I also think of earnings divided by the interest I owe on my loans. Okay, so let's look at a fixed payment coverage ratio and here we could look, um, we look at earnings before interest and taxes plus any lease payments. And we're going to divide by interest plus lease payments plus principal payments plus deferred stock dividends times one divided by one minus the tax rate. So this is by far the most complex formula we've had, but it's still a pretty easy formula. Once you have these variables laid out using order of operations, it's really that, not that hard to calculate. But we're looking at the fixed payment cover ratio. So it looks at our earnings in relationship to the fixed payments that we have to make. And again, the higher this number, the better. Okay, so if we look at a common size, um, we'll call it a common size income statement, we have our year over year and we put things in percentages. So we keep the sales revenue at the same 100% and then we look at the, pros, the gross profit margin and if 2014 is, 2015 is lower than 2014, we say it's worse. If of course the goods sold is higher, we say it's worse. Um, we look at this, you know, the selling expense is, is, has gone down, so that's better. And general administration expenses have gone up, so that's worse. Our lease expenses have gone down, so that's better. And depreciation expense has gone down, so that's better. Our total operating expense has gone down, so that's better. Our operating profit margin has gone up, that's better. And our interest expense has gone down, so that's better. Our operating, our net profit before tax has, has gone up, so that's better. However, our total taxes have increased, so that's worse. But that's also something you have to look in relationship as a percentage to sales. So it's, so it's not, it depends on how much worse. Okay. The, in this case, it's sales are the same, it's worse. Net profit after taxes is better, because it increased. Less preferred dividends, we're paying less than preferred dividends, so that's better. And the net profit margin percentage has increased, so that's better. So here we're looking at, again, a year-over-year -year improvement on what we call a, a common size financial statement. Okay. Okay, so this is gross. The profitability ratios, I think, are the most important ratios to look at as an analyst and also to help you with the Zoom simulation. Now, if you want to do well in the Zoom simulation, and if you want to do well as a financial manager, you have to increase your gross profit margins. This is what every company does. Every company is, is constantly looking to reduce the cost of goods sold um, to increase their gross profits. And if you increase your gross profits, your gross profit margin goes up. And it's a very simple formula. Sales minus cost of goods sold, which is, again, 
labor and materials in the products you sell divided by sales gives you a gross margin percentage. The higher the better. So for example, in the Zoom simulation, you start off at 40% gross average gross profit margins. If that number goes down in year in when you complete the first year, you will not do well in the simulation. And if that number continues to go down, you continue to do poorly in the simulation. So you want to get that profit margin percentage up at least by five percentage points every round. And you want to end up, if you start off at 40%, hopefully you're ending up at 60, 65% by the end of the simulation. Now, operating profit margins is the next pro important profit margin to look at. And we take the operating profits divided by sales. So operating profits, after you take out cost of goods sold and, and operating business expenses of operating the, the you know, basically the business, um, you get your operating profits or EBIT. Divide that by sales and you get your operating profit margin, which is almost always lower than the, than the gross profit margin. I would say 99.9% .9 of the time it will be lower. Now, if you overspend in advertising, you may wind up shrinking your operational profit margin uh, to too much. So you have to make sure that the amount that you're advertising makes sense for what you're trying to sell. So if you are greatly expanding your advertising budget faster than you're expanding your profits, your operational profit margins will go down. And when your profit margins go down, it affects five or six other variables, uh, uh, five or six other ratios in your overview points that will also go down in tandem with your profit margins. Now your net profit margin, after you take out interest and taxes, you have your net profit margin, or earnings available to common shareholders, divided by sales. So again, this is gonna be the smallest of the profit margins. Uh, but again, here too, if you borrow too much money, and pay too much interest on the money that you borrowed, you're going to greatly have you're going to have trouble increasing your net profit margins. And if you don't increase your net profit margins, your return on assets, your return on equity, your return um, on actually total asset turnover, all these variables, these ratios will be lower as well. So you want to really make sure that you borrow money when you need to. That's going to help you increase your profits in your business, but you're not borrowing money that's not being used effectively because that's going to lower your net profit margin. So earnings per share is simply the earnings available to common shareholders divided by the amount number of outstanding shares. So if you had earnings of 200 and, uh, 221,000 divided by uh, number of outstanding shares of 76,000, you have earnings per share of $2.90 per share, which is, you know, and that number needs to go up every year. Your earnings per share have to has to go up every year. Now, if companies issue new shares of stock, so in the Zoom simulation, if you're borrowing or issuing new equity and new shares of stock, your number of outstanding shares will increase, which will make your earnings per share decrease. So you may have a situation where your profits and revenues increase, but your earnings per share decrease because you borrowed, sorry, you issued too much stock. So it, when you can, when you have in a position of making enough profits, you want to start buying back your shares of stock to increase your earnings per share. And that's why you find, you hear a lot of companies announcing these stock buyback programs because inside these stock buyback programs, companies are trying to reduce the amount of outstanding shares to increase their earnings per share. Okay, let's look at total, uh, let's see, return on total assets, ROA. So what we're looking here is we're looking to measure uh, earnings available to common shareholders divided by total assets. So again, earnings available to, uh, to common shareholders is, is basically your net income. And if we divide that by your assets, you get the return on assets. So you look at your assets as, as, a, as one number. I have, th have 3.6 million dollars in assets that generated $221,000 of profit. That's a 6% return. So what you want to do next year is if you can increase your profits, you're going to be increasing your return on assets. You want your assets to be as much, as effective as possible. So for, for a company, if they have some big assets like factories, in order to increase their return, they should operate them not eight hours a day, but 24 hours a day. So they could get even more product and get their assets to generate more products that they could sell and earn, earn more earnings and get a higher return on their assets. Um, or they want to replace expensive assets, sell them off with maybe cheaper assets or more inexpensive assets or more efficient assets to increase the return. 
So say you were you had a pizza store and you had a, you had a pizza oven that could only make three pizzas at a time, but yet you have demand for um, making up to 10 pizzas at the time is what you could sell, but you're giving up sales because you don't have a big enough capacity of your oven. So investing in a bigger oven will cost more money and increase the value of your assets, but it'll also triple your sales. So you have to look at that relationship. Return on equity is looking at your earnings compared to your um, equity or your net profits to your equity. So equity is really the money that you put into the company. So you want to see what type of return am I getting on the, for the money I'm putting into the company. And the more money you put into the company, and if, you're, if your earnings are the same and you're putting more money into your company paying down your debt, you'll see your return on equity decrease, which, is a, which if you're analyzing it and you're seeing that the return on equity, return on equity is decreasing because I'm increasing the size of my equity pool, that's not that bad. However, if your return on equity is decreasing because your earnings are decreasing, that would be a bad return on equity. So you have to look at re return on equity closely to see is, is this number decreasing because my earnings are decreasing or is it decreasing because my equity is increasing? If your equity is increasing, that's not a bad result. But if your profits are decreasing, that would be a bad result. Uh, price to earnings, what's commonly known as a PE ratio. So these are market ratios. So we look at how many times the business is trading uh, in comparison to its earnings. So the price of the business divided by the earnings for the business. So for stocks, we look at the stock price per share divided by the earnings per share. So if we have a stock price of $32 and earnings of 2.90, we're gonna have 11, about 11 P ratio. So the stock price here is 11 times earnings. So if you take earnings per share of 290 times it by 11, you get the $32. So it's trading at 11 times earnings. So basically, say you had a business and your business generated $25,000 worth of profits a year. Um, or, or we can say there's one share in the company and your earnings per share is $25,000 and you're able to sell the business for $250,000, you're selling the business for, for 10 times earnings. So that's what it's really looking at, the multiple of earnings that your company is valued at. And the higher this number, the more highly valued your company is. So this number can sometimes tell you whether your company is undervalued or overvalued when you look at peers. Okay, we have the market to book ratio, M, M divided by B, and this is the market price. Market price relates to, that's stock price. So stock price per share divided by book value per share. Now, what is book value per share? It's the common equity divided by the number of outstanding shares. So the book value per share says, if I were to close the business down, how much, say I was to take the business, pay off all my debt, and just be left with um, my equity. So you take your equity divided by your, your common stock and you get your book value per share. How much of your stock price is actually book value? Now the book value in relationship to, the stock price in relationship to the, va the book gives you an idea of how much your stock price is trading above your book value. So say you had a company that had $10, had $10 per share of book value and it's trading at $20. So your market to book ratio would be two. The stock's trading at two times the book value, which, which is not uncommon. You want generally companies stock price are higher than the book value. So this just gives you an idea of how much, you know, if they're getting to be too close equal, there could be a problem because generally companies should be trading at least two times book value. But again, depends on the industry. So here we have a book value per share of 1.7 million, and we have 76,000 outstanding shares. It gives us a book value per share of $23 per share. And if the market price, the stock price is $32, the, the um, market to book ratio is 1.4, meaning the stock price, the stock price is 1.4 times the book value. So again, it's, it's a measure of value. It's a measure of market how much the market is valuing, valuing your company above its book value. So the book value is really the lowest price a company should be valued at because it should be, that's the starting point, saying that the book value is saying this is the value of the assets of the company after, the, after you pay back your debt and assuming no value for the business would be the lowest value a company could generally have. So if a company is actually trading below book value, there might be some outstanding problems, such as lawsuits that are causing that. Okay. Um, 
So in this slide, which is look look in your book on table three eight if you want to see a bigger version of this. I know it's kind of tiny, but here we could look at we want to look at the ratios in a year over year comparison. Just like in a Zoom simulation, your overview points are year over year comparisons. That's how companies, how financial analysts measure companies. They look at you know your current ratio is it improving so we didn't we did improve but we went down in 2005 however our quick ratio improved every year which is good the if we just look at the current ratio it's okay but because we take out the inventory we see that we are making an improvement every year and we're above the industry average we're good so we look at the cross sectional and the time series the cross sectional would be uh, us against the industry and time series would be how we're doing through time so for all the ratios, inventory turns are going up and we're beating the industry, so we're good in all categories here. But collection periods are, are going up and we're higher than the industry, so that is poor because we want low collection periods. And if we look at total asset turnover, we see that our total asset turnover is better than the industry, but we're kind of not we're not improving much in this area. Debt ratios are going up. Um, but we're not that much higher than the industry. We want these to go lower, so they're just okay. Um, if we look at, let's go down to what's really important, these profits. So our profits are moved up from 13 to 14, but moved down to 2015. But we're still beating the industry average, so we're okay in those categories. Not great though. Operating profits have gone down and then 2014, but then gone up in 2015, and we're beating the industry so we're good in, in the cross-sectional, okay, in the time series, overall it's good. Net profit margins, uh, again, went down and then up, but we're beating the industry, and we are improving going up, so we're, so that's basically how we want to look at it. How are we doing through time, and how are we doing compared to the industry average? If we look at earnings per share, we see that those, like the profits, have gone down and back up, but we're beating the industry. Uh, return on assets have gone down and back up, Again, same story, beating the industry. And return on equity has gone down and back up, but we're, we are beating the industry. So similar story, all three places there. PE multiple has gone down, then up. So we're lower than the industry, which means we might be a little bit more value, undervalued. So if we're lower than the industry, our PE ratio, our company may be a little bit undervalued compared to the industry, but not by much. And our market to book has gone down and up, but we're still a, um, a little bit above industry, so it's just okay, nothing spectacular. So this is basically how you would analyze, and this you could do with your results of your company in a Zoom simulation, how has your company improved year over year? The industry, your, um, your company chart will show you that, and the industry chart uh, will show you how you're comparing to the industry averages. Okay, let's talk about the DuPont system. So the DuPont system is a system of analysis to help dissect the financial statements a little bit more quickly and understand and assess the financial condition of the company. It merges the income statement and the balance sheet together uh, into two summary measures of profitability. So the DuPont formula relates to the firm's return on assets and to its return on equity using financial leverage multiplier, FLM, which is the ratio of total assets to common stock equity. So return assets or return equity are shown in a series of equations relating them to each other so we can find points of weakness. The basic formula for return on equity, as we know, is net profit margin times total asset turnover. So we could calculate the return on equity by multiplying these two other ratios. So the um, earnings divided by sales gives us our net profit margin and sales divided by total assets gives us a total asset turnover, which equals earnings um, net profits basically divided by total assets, which gives us our return on assets. So we covered this formula early in the return on assets, but if you break that out, you can actually see these two variables, net profit margin and total asset turnover, can be multiplied together to get the same result. So this can give us a hint of where the problem is. Is the problem that sales are being reduced, or assets are being increased, or profits are being reduced? So uh, if we look at return on assets as far as net profits uh, multiplied by total asset turnover, we get return uh, assets is 6.1. Now, if we want to look at return equity, we could take return assets and multiply it by the financial leverage multiplier. So return assets, again, net profits divided by total assets. Remember, earnings available to common stockholders is basically net profits divided by, by total assets is our 
return on assets. Total assets divided by common equity is our uh, what we call our financial leverage multiplier. How much of our assets are leveraged? And by dividing by equity, we can tell the, the leverage measure. So again, we learn that you know earnings available to common stockholders divided by common stock equity gives us return on equity. But here are the four factors that you can multiply against each other to give us that result as well. So here, return you know return on um, we're looking at return on assets and in the financial leverage multiplier, we get a return on equity of 12.5%. Now, this is sort of the system. So our net income, these are the variables that the, the variables we take from our net income. These are the variables we take from a profit uh, statement. I'm sorry, this is the variables from the income statement and these are the variables from the balance sheet. Sorry about that. Now, taking our earnings, dividing it by sales, we get our net profit margin. Taking our sales divided by total assets, we get our total asset turnover. Taking our liabilities plus our shareholders' equity, we get our, our total liabilities and shareholders' equity, which also equals our total assets. Divide that by our common equity, we get our financial leverage multiplier. Now divide, um, sorry, multiply total asset, total return on assets by the leverage multiplier, we get our return on equity. So return to equity is sort of the king on the pyramid of the DuPont system. And return to equity is really, at the end of the day, this is how much money that we're making based on um, the money we put into the company. So the equity or the money we put into the company, this is the number we really care about because this is our return, how much money we're making from the money we put into the company. And if there's a problem, we could look at this versus you know last year and say, is it return on equity? Was our return on assets that's the problem because that went down, or is it the is it the financial multiplier because that went up? Is that the issue, uh, or sorry, the financial multiplier went down? Is that the issue uh, creating a problem with return on equity? So if return on equity was lower and we saw that return on assets were lower, we'd say okay, it's not the leverage multiplier; it's the assets the problem. Is it the profit margin or the total assets that's the problem? So the profit margin was the same, we and the, and the total assets turnover was was larger we'd say okay it's the assets that's the problem is it revenues or sales is it revenues or assets causing that problem meaning did the assets grow faster than the sales reducing our total asset turnover which reduces our return on assets which reduces our equity return on equity you know if um if the assets were the problem we look to see or is it because we're increasing current assets or are we increasing net fixed assets so this is just a way to kind of say if there's a problem, if a return equity went down, this is how we could quickly figure out where the problem is. Is it with ROA or FLM? If it's with FLM, is it the um, is it the is it a problem with assets and liabilities or equity? And if it's uh, assets and liability, is it the liabilities growing too fast or the equity? And if it's the liabilities, is it current or long term? If it was net profit margin, say it was return on assets was a problem and we had a lower net profit margin, was it because the sales decreased or is it because the income decreased? If the income decreased, which was it? Um, a factor of, of increasing cost of goods sold, increasing operating expense, increasing interest expense, increasing taxes, more preferred dividends. So this is the DuPont system is just a system we use to try to nail down where the problem is. So we could just look as an analyst, we'll just look at return on equity. If this is lower, then we'll use this DuPont analysis to figure out where is this originating from? What is the financial item that's creating this problem? And sometimes it could be a combination of lower return on equity and lower financial leverage. Okay, so dissecting the ROA, which I was doing before, um, we want to examine, um, so birth, uh, both for, let's see, if we look at table 3.5, which was this previous table, that's oh, 3.2, actually 3.5 from the textbook, we can examine the total asset turnover for Dell and Home Depot. So the fir both firms have assets of 1.6 times a year, and Dell's return on equity, return on assets is 4.3, Home Depot's is 6.5. Why is Home Depot's higher? The DuPont analysis will, will tell us. And the answer lies by using the DuPont analysis. And when we use analysis, we can see that Home Depot's net profit margin is 4% compared to Dell's, which is 2.7. So that's why uh, Home Depot's return on assets is significantly higher because they have a better profit margin. Okay, 
So that's that's the end of this chapter. So again, what we learned here, we reviewed the um, common financial statements, income, balance sheet, and statement of cash flows. This is not the first time you should have seen these. This is a review. You should have covered this in financial accounting or even perhaps in introduction to business. So this, this chapter is sort of a review of these financial statements and why they're important. And we must review them because we need them to generate the financial ratios because we need to understand what the financial ratios are and how to analyze the financial ratios, especially analyzing them for liquidity and activity. We also have to analyze the financial ratios between debt and leverage. Uh, and we want to use the financial ratios to analyze profitability and the market value in the marketplace. And finally, we want to use the DuPont system of analysis to do a complete ratio analysis to figure out if there is a problem, where is it originating? So sort of the DuPont analysis is a detective work to figure out where is the problem occurring so management can address it and, and, and fix it. Okay, that's the end of this chapter. Now, at this point, you should be able to, you should go into the homework manager and complete the homework uh, for chapter three. Also look at the spreadsheet problem for chapter three. Thank you, and I'll talk to you soon.